Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Once again, it's a tremendous pleasure, privilege, and opportunity to join you wherever you are this time as we bring you the Know Your Bible program. Here we are on Church Media TT on YouTube. And so if you're here for the first time, then we encourage you and invite you to subscribe to this channel, Church Media TT. And of course, you will have access to all of, of the content that we have on this particular channel. And uh, of course, there's a little notification bell. If you click on that, it means that your device will always alert you when we have new content. Know Your Bible is premiered every Sunday morning at this particular time, uh, 7 o'clock, on this particular channel. And of course, you can always go back and uh, listen again, or if you missed it, get it then. So we do appreciate that. And we ask all members of the Churches of Christ in Trinidad and Tobago to take the opportunity to give the link to your friends and family members. It's an opportunity for them to hear the Word of God from an evangelistic point of view. After all, Jesus did say to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. With that in mind, we want to give thanks before we get into the lesson and we'll tell you where we are picking up so that you will be able to go back and you can even get the last program that would be in line with what we are talking about so that you'll be able to follow us. So let's give God thanks. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being gracious and kind. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, you sent your only Son into this world to pay the price so that we, O oh Lord, could get the opportunity to have our sins washed away and to have a relationship with you, O oh God, which was lost when sin took place in the Garden of Eden. We are thankful, O oh God, for the sacrifice of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as we deliver these lessons, Father, that you will be with me and guide me, that I will stand in the shadow of the cross to declare your counsel, the truth, Lord, in love and simplicity. Thank you for the church, which contains the saved, your institution, your kingdom, Father, which your Son came and established. Guide us, Father, and we pray for open hearts and open minds. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Okay, so before Brother Wendell took up this last series that he was doing, we were looking at the distinct identity of the New Testament worship. Prior to that, we looked a bit at the distinct identity of the New Testament church. We saw that God operated from a point of view of a pattern. Now, why is a pattern so important? Patterns establish identity. You look at certain seamstress, tailors, some of those persons, and especially people who start out learning the trade, will use patterns because you could take a dress pattern, a shirt pattern or something, and you can cut out around the pattern and get the shape and the form of the particular item that you are going to put together. So patterns are important. You could tell a, a, a Toyota RAV4 from a Nissan because they come out of different molds. And so patterns are important. And so having looked at the distinct identity of the New Testament church, we, we are able to observe how God operated. And with, with a pattern in mind, we can distinguish variations that differ or move away from it. In the same way, 
when we look at the worship of the New Testament church, we realize that God has a specific design. After all, if Christ is the head of the church, and if he established the church, then of course he has the right to determine and to tell us how it ought to function. If God is the one who put his son on the cross to die and pay the price for our sins, and he is given a name above every name, and he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, then the worship to him should not be left up to us to decide what we will give. God determined what is necessary to honor his son and to honor him. And so God sets the stage for what we need to do in worship. Worship, therefore, is not to be done through the will of man. So in the last program which we did, looking at the distinct identity of the New Testament worship, you could go back on this channel and you could search. You could put perhaps know your Bible and you could put in the topic, the distinct identity of New Testament worship. And a lot of those lessons that we did will come up. And then the last one that we did, we looked at false worship and we saw false worship included vain worship, ignorant worship, and also will worship. Will worship is something that is very prevalent because what it says is simply this, that mankind has voluntarily adopted certain practices that are used as worship to God. Now, sincere as he or she may be, that does not say that God will accept what is offered. We must understand that God is the one who determines. And if God has said what he requires, then we should look to follow that. So now we saw what worship is, true worship in general, false worship. We want to look more now at the corporate side of worship. In other words, every day we live, if we are children of God, saved by the blood of Jesus, through obedience to the gospel, then we are now in Christ, our sins are forgiven. We worship God every day. This is a new life. Paul told the young man Titus in Titus 2, 11 and following, he says, For the grace of God which brings the salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So each Christian has a responsibility to now live in a way that honors God. Worship, therefore, is from the heart. It is what the heart believes convicted of is connected to if jesus is sovereign and supreme in the heart of mankind then the desire to do whatever he says comes into the picture and as a newborn christian you know now you have a new life in christ therefore your life before god every day is worship it is service to him so there's individual worship which takes place every day. If we live right, if we do good, if we promote the gospel, we are honoring God. And so we are adding value or giving worth to who God is. Worship from an old word which meant worship is saying that in worship, we add value to God. We give credit and meaning and worth to God. That means we must do what God says. How can you give value to someone when you despise what they say and just bypass it and do whatever you want? That's not going to happen. So we understand that we worship God every day as individuals. But then there's a corporate worship where God calls all of his children, those who have obeyed the gospel, 
He calls them all in a general assembly based upon wherever you are located. So you have the universal church, which is made up of all the members of the body of Christ who have obeyed the same gospel as revealed in scripture. Notice my words. Not just everyone who says, I am a Christian. Because just as people give what they want for worship, people also do what they want and say they have salvation, not regarding what God has laid down in his word. So all those who have obeyed the gospel and who have been added to the church by God, Acts 2.47, you don't join Christ's church, the church that belongs to Christ. He adds you to it when you obey his word. If you fail to obey his word, he will not add you to his church. You will still be lost. And so people need to become sober-minded and understand that religion is not simply something that you follow because society accepts it. Society is run by Satan. He is the God of this world. And he will not tell you the truth. So in a system governed by Satan, anything goes. So long as it's not what God wants, Satan is very happy. You can have a look alike. He has no problem with that because he knows it's not the same thing. So we must be particular to follow the word of God. Because the word of God is important. It tells us what God wants us to do. So corporate worship would be those Christians, those persons who have obeyed the gospel, assembling together. And in Acts 20 and verse 7, we are told that the disciples were gathered together upon the first day of the week. First day of the week, that's a study by itself, right? But we talked about that a little bit in previous programs. Then in Acts, the second chapter, we find it's the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost falls upon what we know as the first day of the week. It is what we call Sunday in our calendar. It's the first day of the week. Or what you will call the eighth day if you want to go that far, right? But it's the first day of the week. So in Acts chapter 2, the gospel of Christ is proclaimed on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a planned occasion by a God who knows what he's doing and who has carefully planned out his strategies as to how he would bring about salvation to a lost and dying world. And so Peter is featured as presenting that message using the keys to the kingdom that were given to him according to Matthew 16, 13 through 18. And so after having proclaimed that gospel message and the people became convicted, they asked the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ or by the authority of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, so then those who had received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So here were the disciples and they proclaimed that word and about 3,000 souls were then obedient to the gospel and were added to the apostles. Then verse 42 says, they were continuing, all of these were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Notice, they didn't go off and find something that they wanted to believe in. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Note the context. Breaking of bread, fellowship, prayer, following the apostles' teaching. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Well, why not? Do you understand what happened on Pentecost? And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles because they were the ones who were empowered by the Holy Spirit to perform these signs and wonders. And all those who had believed were together. 
and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. You see, when people just find something that is really important to them and this gospel would have impacted them to see themselves as being nobodies and nothing but because of Christ they are now seeing value in their life and they see that value in God and they see that value in others who have done the same thing and they realize the universal nature of sin but they also now realize the universal nature of salvation so there was a caring for the family members of the body of Christ and so those who didn't have those who had sold stuff that they possessed and was, and was able then they were able then to share with those who didn't have and verse 46 says and day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house notice now Scripture says they were continuing with one mind in the temple and then they would have left the temple and breaking bread from house to house they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord and the Lord notice and the Lord was adding to the church or to their number day by day those who were being saved so every time somebody is saved god adds them to the people who are saved already and whenever somebody obeys that same gospel they are saved god adds them to the people who have obeyed that same gospel and the church grows so now what we have is a body corporate people who are together and haven't obeyed that gospel and since pentecost is the first day of the week we are seeing here for the first time how Christians are together and that they are observing something in honor of Christ they are breaking bread in a context of prayer and fellowship they are in worship to God and other scriptures will support this because we have passages like 1 Corinthians 16 1 and 2 which tells us that there was a regular assembly of the church on the first day of the week in acts 20 and verse 7 when we go there we will also see that there was a regular assembly of the lord's people corporate on the first day of every week and one of the distinct aspects of worship was observing or partaking of the lord's supper the lord's supper was taken in memory of Christ who died and so I think it's important to understand that Matthew chapter 26 talks about the institution of the Lord's Supper but I think it's important for us to understand what it is was happening and how the Lord's Supper came about through what was happening the disciples were given instructions to have preparation made for the Passover. The Passover was something which God gave to the Jews. And again, very specific. They couldn't just deviate from whatever God had laid down in his word regarding the Passover. It was designed by God to help the Jews understand remember they were enslaved in the land of Egypt they were in bondage four centuries of slavery and then on that dreaded night when the destroying angel passed through the land of Egypt and destroyed the firstborn in all those houses the male firstborn where no blood was on the doorpost so the lamb was slain and of course God gave instructions for them to eat of the flesh but the blood was put on the doorpost and when the destroying angel came through the land of Egypt guess what happened he passed over 
the house where the blood was put on the lintels, no harm came to those who resided therein. So hence the word Passover brings to mind how God passed over their houses because of the lamb's blood on the lintel. And so they had what was called the Feast of Passover. So the Passover was established to be a reminder to the children of Israel of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. God commanded his people to remember those events. In the next program, we are going to talk a little bit more about this and see how the Lord's Supper comes out from the occasion where the disciples had assembled and the Lord was there with them to observe the Passover. Something new was to come. Something that would now not just be nationalistic, but which will be universal in nature. Something which would not just pertain to the nation of Israel, but to all peoples of the earth. The nation of Israel was in bondage in Egypt. But all nations of the world are in bondage under sin. So we have the universal problem of sin. But we look at how God developed a nation. And I always tell people this. You've got to follow the scriptures. God did not look among the people and choose a nation. God developed a nation after one man who was faithful and devoted because God, God's plan was to enter the world of humanity, to take on human form, to show us who God is like. But not just that. There was a reason, bigger reason behind why God entered the world of humanity as a human being. And that was necessary in order to effect a means by which the world could be saved. So you don't want to miss, we encourage you to join us then as we are going to look at the Lord's Supper as it comes out from the Passover and look at it, a, a few points to understand similarities of either. So don't forget click notification don't forget to subscribe if you have not yet done so we'll be looking forward put a note in the chat let us know you are there if you have a desire to study the word of god then let us know we'll be happy to be able to contact you and to facilitate the study of that word okay so until next time i'm a haste person bidding you God's blessing. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he came to set me free in me. So I might live with him in glory. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe. What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he came to set the pain free. So I might live with him in 